Well, Broadway fans, I am very excited because I am sitting here with a composer, sound designer, who has more Tony nominations this year than any other individual at this uh, virtual Tony's we're go going to have at some point. Um, I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. This is Daniel Kluger. And you are nominated for score and sound design for The Sound Inside and for sound design for Seawall Life. Did you, you know, have any idea that you were going to hear your name called three times on, on nomination morning? What was that like for you? Uh, yeah, well, you know, my phone blew up. It was a total <laughs> surprise. I think I wasn't even aware the nominations were happening or, you know, it's been such a tumultuous year. So yeah, yeah it was a total surprise. <laughs> and um, your category for score uh, specifically is very unique this year because for the first time in the history of the Tonys, it is made up of entirely music from plays, um, which, is, which has never happened. It's a very small group of plays that have actually made it in there. Have you been able in this weird year to talk to your fellow nominees at all about that situation? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to to know all of them personally and have, have chatted a bit. Um, and, you know, uh, they're all amazing artists in their own right. And we, we, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's such a sad thing for the overall season to be so abbreviated. Um, right. And you know, it would be amazing if there were a full musical nominated as well. But I think that um, as someone who works primarily in scoring for plays, as in that's what I usually do, um, it is a, it's a quite different art form from crafting a musical in development over years. And um, yeah, the group of us were chatting. It's just, it's, it, it's really, um, you know, we're, we're, we feel fortunate. I think that it's a, a moment to draw attention to a particular part of a craft in the industry that um, doesn't have its own category in, in other years. Yeah, it's a nice opportunity because I think uh, it's an integral part of plays on Broadway, but often doesn't get um, get a chance to be talked about as much. So what, what for you, if you're creating a score for a play, what speaks to you about that process versus doing something for a musical? So scoring a play is much more like scoring a film in that you're trying to create, um, you're trying to build a world and an emotional vocabulary for a, dram for a dramatic piece that's mm -hmm. in service of text. And um, that uh, uh, works on much on a subliminal level. Um, and, uh, you know, it, Typically, you're working in a very abbreviated, high, highly productive last period of production. So instead of writing the music um, over years and really crafting it, you're sometimes responding in the moment in the theater. Um, you know, I, I write music on uh, the piano, but then I bring a whole rig into the theater to be able to respond in tech rehearsals and write new cues with everybody there. And it's a, it's a very dynamic process. Yeah. Um, and you have actually worked on musicals before. Your prior nomination uh, last year was for uh, the revival of Oklahoma, where you sort of turned that into this amazing bluegrass uh, piece. And that was for orchestrations. Um, and I've noticed you, you wear many hats because you've done orchestrations. You've, you're here for your score. You have the sound design nominations. Um, do you always sort of do you look at sound and music as intertwined in theater? Um, well, in theater, every job is intertwined because it's a, just, it's a fundamentally very social and collaborative group medium. Yep. Um, I feel really lucky that I've been able to wear different hats and that I've been entrusted with different types of jobs because um, I think, you know, it, this is an industry that can pigeonhole people. Mm -hmm. So I feel really fortunate that I've had these happy accidents where I've been able to, I mean, I, I'm just so feel so lucky that the RNH estate let us do that project. Um, and, you know, uh, fund I've started as a uh, piano player and, and a accompanist and um, ultimately there's a common sensibility of that, that runs through 
orchestrating and scoring and sound mm -hmm. design, which is that, you know, you're, you have to be a conscientious and sensitive collaborator to the story and the storytelling and the actor and the liveness of the theater and collaborate with the director. Um, you know, and then from there, the, the technical side of each of those jobs varies depending on what you're doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, for me, I, I, I feel really lucky that I've been able to, to, um, exercise different muscles, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also the other, I also love being able to role play different parts of the music department and get to collaborate with other people. Um, cause I feel like it makes me, uh, it makes me better at that part of the job if I'm, you know, able to play the little musical chairs. Like, you know. Right. When, since you mentioned your, your role often does come in towards the end of a, a creative process, where do you sort of grab inspiration from? Do you get it from the script when you, like, do you immediately know what kind of soundscape you're going to create? Um, well, every project has its own signature mm -hmm. beacon, you know? So, um, I mean, Adam's, Adam Rapp's play, The Sound Inside, has such a strong, um, haunting, literary, uh, there's just something in the DNA of that writing that um, it actually was, it took a long time to figure out what to do for it. Mm. Um, and I wrote a ton of music that we threw away. Uh, and it, so sometimes it has to do with experimentation. You know, you might write, you might write the, the music that ends up being used in the production in a sort of very intense productive period that's collaborative in the end. But in order to get there, I have to write, I have to try out, you know, half a dozen ideas that are completely wrong just to explore my own personal relationship to the material. Mm -hmm. um, that word you use, taunting, is kind of, uh, for his writing, is sort of how I would describe your score to that. Um, I like, I just have memories of lots of great use of strings in the score. It has this very haunting ethereal quality to me. What is the process? Like, how do you decide when you're thinking of music, what instrument is going to best serve the piece? Uh, well, so I often start on the piano because it's my instrument. And that piece actually started as a piano improvisation. Uh, and I actually wrote most of it um, as a personal writing exercise, and I didn't know I would use it for the play. Mm. Um, and and so, you know, sometimes if I'm trying to live with the play, I'm I'm writing every day for just for my own exercise. And then it it was actually only until a couple of days later that I thought to play that for the director. Um, in any case, that started as a piano improvisation. And then once I lived with it a little bit, sometimes you can tell whether, you know, if you write on the piano, it's, it's meant to be on the piano or whether it's a, um, a structural idea that can be voiced in something else. Mm -hmm. um, with that piece, I was able to work with uh, Momenta Quartet, this um, amazing string quartet that uh, um, I just, you know, I had worked with them a few times before and I could, I could just hear that they would um, be able to, bring it to life so yeah and your work on the sound inside you provided both the score and sound design uh for seawall a life you uh just did the sound design for it Stuart earl provided the music if that's the case when you have uh, another collaborator there do you sort of feel um when you're creating the sound that you have to sort of work off the mood that's already been created by by him like fitting in like a puzzle piece uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think anyone who works in theater has, um, oh, did I lose you for a second? I'm still here. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's a collaborative art form. So I think when you enter a collaborative process and you know what your role is, that's, that's a, that's, um, that has to do with your ultimate responsibility, what you're accountable for, but, and, and your point of entry to the conversation, but there's so much back and forth. Um, and, you know, it's exciting when you work with good collaborators that 
you enter that space and you don't really know how you're going to be influenced um, by your collaborators. So I don't know. It's um, I really like being able to sound design for other composers. I like uh, also really like um, orchestrating and producing uh, music producing and mixing other other musicians work I sort of I really love I'm a social animal so I really like doing things with other people um, that's more important to me than any particular uh, artistic agenda that I have so yeah yeah um, you know sound design for a play primarily your responsibility is to uh, deal with the delivery of the whole experience to every seat in the theater evenly. Mm -hmm. um, and so on both sound inside and seawall, uh, the, main, the main thing I'm concerned about as a sound designer is the clarity of the text and the overall experience as a legible and emotional uh, delivery of information to each seat. Yeah, and they're both very text uh, language based shows, um, particularly because their solo pieces are close to it. Mary Louise Parker's on stage most of the time, but she's joined by Will Hockman, of course. Um, and then you have Jake Gyllenhaal doing his solo piece and um, Mr. Sturridge doing a solo piece. So it's, it really allows the sound actually to, at least from my vantage point, sort of be um, stand out in a way that Sometimes you may not think of it uh, in a normal setting. How does that affect your work when there's just one person on stage? Both of those plays actually were very similar in some of our, in some of our aesthetic goals and technical challenges, which is that in both cases, we, want, we wanted to feel really intimately close to the voice. Um, and we didn't want the actors in any in any scenario to have to work too too hard. We wanted them to speak as conversationally and as and as naturally as they would in a small theater. Um, but of course, you have hundreds of seats, and it's um, it needs to be clear to the back row. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are just there are amazing things that we can do with amplification these days to to make sure that clarity is delivered, but that um, that the amplification amplification is time aligned and optimized so that uh, it's as transparent and you're not distracted by it. Yeah. Um, and then once you do that, you can create a kind of hypnosis with, with the text where, um, you know, it's almost as though you're listening to an audio book. You're so close to the voice, but you are, you know, but in, in, all, in both of those productions, the actor is alone in a, spatially they're alone in a pretty large room. And so you're having, um, you know, we're, we're trying to create, um, we want to feel like we're in the room that we're in, but we also want to be closer to that voice than we naturally are in such a large space. And then once you do that, you, you are essentially hypnotized into listening to those words. And then when, some, when, when, when another sound does enter, it has to be really special and, and the right, um, you know, drop in the pond, so to speak. I think I remember uh, a couple moments in the sound inside where that type of hypnosis uh, effect you're talking about really struck when there was a few moments where it's almost like the sound was sucked out of the room, um, which then makes, you know, what Mary Louise Parker's about to say feel even more uh, powerful. And do you find that it's also just as important um, to find spaces where there's the absence of sound or the absence of a score? Yeah, absolutely. Um... It, yeah, in both of the pieces, it uh, um, I think ninety five percent of my job is is responsibility to the way the voice interacts with silence, mm -hmm. and that's setting the dynamic range for the whole experience. So then music fits into that, you know. But you're you're calibrating the audience's ear over an hour. Um, yeah. you know. Well. Um... You know, I had talked to one of your fellow nominees, uh, Lindsay Jones from Slave Play. Um, and you're, since you're both nominated in the same two categories, I, I wanted to ask you this question as well before I let you go. Because um, the sound design categories are actually eliminated from the Tonys for a few years before being reinstated. And 
their reasoning was, well, we don't, we're not sure our, you know, voters know all of the nuances um, to, to fully evaluate that category. Um, so I'm curious to hear your take on what is the biggest misconception that you encounter about your job as a sound designer and what do you, you know, hope those voters know? Well, as I said, I think on Broadway, your, your responsibility is about, uh, you, you're, you are the head of the sound department, you are overall responsible for the clarity of experience for every audience member. And so sometimes people mistakenly think that that's a technical job. It involves working with a fair amount of engineering and you have to build a great team of qualified uh, engineers to, to make that possible. But ultimately it's an aesthetic choice and it has to do, I mean, um, you, are, you are making artistic choices about how to um, achieve that clarity and intelligibility um, despite the natural laws of physics, which says that voice is a hundred feet away from me. Mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be that loud and clear. And so, you know, you're, 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 you're bending. Our, our ears are really, really um, good at, at, at detecting a lie. So in order to work in that space artistically and amplify the voice with care, you have to make a bunch of artistic choices about what you're paying attention to. And anyway, um, I don't know if that makes sense. It's a little bit rambly, but um, it, uh, it, it's a technically, it's a, it's a job that's based on a technical foundation, but it is, it is a, and it, it's an aesthetic job. Um, and, you know, it, it would be nice if, uh, it would be nice to um, be able to, I think celebrate that work when it's done well in a way that's distinct from from the category of scoring. Yeah. So I think that's one of the nice things about this year is we can sort of look at those two things separately. Very much and uh, congratulations on being a part of that uh, from your two uh, wonderful projects. Very glad that both of those were, were recognized and you were recognized with uh, three deserved nominations. So oh, everyone who's out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby keep in touch with us throughout Tony Ward's season. We'll keep talking about it until we have a date and uh, know when that's happening. And thank you, Dan, again for your time. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, you too.